Your Bibles, I'd like to look at the first hard text or difficult texts in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the teaching of Christ, let us go on to completion or maturity. Not laying down again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. This we will do if God permits. For, here comes your first cruncher, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they turn aside, that's the Greek word, it is not apostasia, which means to slide back from what you said you believed. This means turn aside to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify for themselves the Son of God all over again and put him to an open shame. For the earth, which drinks in the rain that comes often upon it and brings forth herbs suitable for them by whom it is prepared, receives a blessing from God. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is near to cursing, the end of that is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, the things that accompany salvation, even though we speak this way. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints, and you do minister to them. Dr. Barnhouse once said, The epistle to the Hebrews was written to the Hebrews to tell the Hebrews to stop being Hebrews and to be Christians. And to sever themselves from the Old Testament concept of law and covenant. And to adopt the new covenant which was sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. So let's make some observations on this because there are good scholars that have exegeted this on both sides of the fence. This passage is used quite frequently to teach that you may lose your salvation and that you may fall away to eternal judgment. So let's look at it. Verse 4, it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the word, good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they turn aside from it, to renew them again, or to revive them again, to repentance. We know something from verse 6. The people it's talking about underwent repentance, which means they had a change of mind, a change of heart. They received the word of God, as Jesus said in the parable of the sower, gladly. But when the pressure came and the difficulties came, Jesus said they had no root in themselves. And so they withered and perished. So we know that it's talking about repentance in verse 6, but it is possible to repent and not to believe. It is possible to have a change of mind and not to walk in the light with God. It is possible to hear the good word of God, to see the powers of the world to come, such as the restoration of human beings in divine healing and the conquest of demons by the power of God, and to taste of the heavenly gift in the sense that the individual who is professing to be a believer bases it upon their understanding and their comprehension of the Word of God and their fellowship in whatever church or churches they may choose to go to. I think that the passage is teaching that there are individuals who are the best counterfeits in the world. And they would fool anybody. Very similar to the tares in the wheat field. They can go along with the Holy Spirit. 
They can taste the heavenly gift. Now, the word taste there is a very interesting word. When Jesus was on the cross, they gave him vinegar mixed with gall, and he tasted it. But he would not take it in. There are people that taste the blessings of God, that taste the power of God, that experience, if you will, these things which we have experienced as believers, and yet have never ever made a total commitment to God, never said, whatever it takes, whatever the cost, I will be your disciple. Denied themselves, taken up the cross, and come after him. The key is coming after him. It's possible to deny yourself. It's possible even to endure suffering, taking up the cross for the sake of Christ, and yet never to have walked with him. Remember in John chapter 6, it's very clear. Some of Jesus' disciples, what is a disciple? A follower. Some of Jesus' disciples did not walk with him any longer. Which means they were content to follow him, listen to his teaching, say they were his disciples, partake of the food for the 5,000 and the 4,000, and talk about the coming of the kingdom. And yet, when Jesus finally brought them to the place of a total commitment and said, I am the bread of life, You've got to eat of me and drink my blood, or you have no life in you. By which he obviously meant in John 6, you've got to come to me, and you've got to believe in me. He that comes to me shall never be hungry. He that believes in me shall never thirst. To me, it's very apparent that the world is filled with tares. And these tares were sown by the enemy. And they are all around us. We will never know all of them until harvest time. But they are tares. So it is possible to be enlightened. There are people that say, and the word enlightened means to have knowledge of, to know something is true. There are people that are enlightened. And they say, that's right. It is true. I believe it is true. They are enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift, but they have not taken it in. They were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, just as Judas was, in that he was sent out and used the name of Jesus and the power of God to heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and raise the dead and cast out demons. Yet the scripture says, Judas was never a believer. He was a devil who masqueraded as a Christian. So, so far as I can see from this verse 4, you're really hanging yourself by your own rope if you say it's impossible to restore these people to repentance. And at the same, excuse me, if you're saying from verse 4 that this is teaching that you lose your salvation, it also says it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. Which means that any person who has ever turned aside from their faith and I rather think that the room is filled with them, who because of sin at one time or another in their lives have walked away from Christ in the light and into darkness. Well, if you're going to teach that doctrine, then you better be prepared for the word impossible. Because the word impossible means exactly that. If you walked away and turned aside and the passage is to be taken literally, you're never going to come back. In fact, it's impossible for you to get back. Now, how many people have turned aside from their faith in Christ at one time or another in their lives and walked in their own directions? This is not the morning for hypocrites now. It's the morning for honest people, okay? Now, you are sitting in this Bible class, getting taught the Word of God, supporting the ministry, believing in the work, witnessing to people on the job and in your families. You have obviously... Returned. So the passage, far from teaching that you lose your salvation and can't get it back, says that there are people who can be enlightened, 
taste the heavenly gift, go along with the Holy Spirit, and taste the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. There are people that can do this. They truly repent. They have a change of mind, a change of direction. But they do not persist in their faith. They do not persist in what they said they believed. And therefore, they are not renewed to repentance. Dr. Gable, I once had an illustration which I liked very much. He said, you know, when you exegete this passage, Walter, he said, you ought to remember the context of the times in Jerusalem when this book was written. Remember, the writer of this book was greatly versed in the Old Testament. And he was trying to set it in an Old Testament context so that we would get the message. At the time in Jerusalem, there were Jews who made professions of repentance who said they were disciples of Jesus, who went along with the kingdom of God, as long as there was no pressure. Then when the pressure came, the priest in the temple would slit the throat of a sow, this is history, and let the blood of the sow flow in the gutter outside the temple, in the street. And they would have the people who were professing Christians who recanted, spit in the blood of the pig, and say that it had no more power to save than of the accursed false Messiah, Jesus. Dr. Gabeline said, you have to take that into consideration too. Maybe what we're dealing with are people that were such good counterfeits, they fooled everybody. But when the time came for them to show whether or not they had really undergone regeneration, they didn't. So that is another class of people to which it could be referring. But one thing is certain. If it's teaching that you can lose your salvation, it is also teaching you can't get it back. And that is not consistent with Christian experience based on the Word of God. Is not consistent with what we know this morning sitting in this room. I think the key to this, hard nut, is found in verse 7. So let's take a look at that. The earth, which drinks in the rain that comes often upon it, and produces herbs which is suitable for those who planted it, receives blessings from God. There's one kind of ground which is described here. It's good ground. How do you know it's good ground versus bad ground if you look in a field? There are two fields side by side. How do you know which field will be productive and which field will be unproductive of what you sow? There's only one way I know. You have to wait and see what happens to what was planted in the field. Look at this. The earth that receives the rain and produces... The fruit is the good ground. But the earth which produces thorns and briars is rejected by the farmers and it's near to cursing and being unproductive. The end of it is to be burned. So what do you do with it? If it comes up a bad crop in the field, you burn it. The ground lays fallow and it regenerates and produces fruit. The thing I think that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us here is what kind of fruit do you have in your life and take a good look at it because that's going to tell you what kind of ground you are. If you produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life, love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and goodness and self-control and faith, you are good ground. If you don't produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life, which is the first thing that happens to a person that's really regenerated, then you are a tear in the wheat field. And you will be burned in the end because the angels will separate, Jesus said, the redeemed from the lost. Now, I do not wish to oversimplify. But I think verse 9 is a very simple statement. Beloved, as to the Christians, 
we are persuaded better things of you. Your end is not to be burned because you don't produce the thorns and the briars. We're persuaded better things of you, the things that go along with salvation. So what is the proof that the saints persevere in the service of God? The fact that they persevere. What is the proof that land is good ground? It produces a crop that's good crop. And what is the proof of the land which is deceptive and is not the good ground, bad ground, what it produces? If there's no love, if there's no joy, if there's no peace, if there's no patience, if there's no goodness, if there's no self-control, if there's no faith indicated in the life of the believer, there is no reason to suppose the ground is good. And therefore, you're not dealing with a believer. 4, verse 10. God is not unrighteous. He will not forget your work and labor of love which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and you minister now. What is God not going to forget? He's not going to forget those of us who act by grace through faith, to minister to the needs of the body of Christ and to proclaim his gospel. He's not going to forget that. He is not unrighteous. He's just. He will remember it. What does it prove then if you are remembered by God? It proves your good ground. Because only the good ground produces the good fruit. Now I add one thought to this and I think it covers it thoroughly. Impossible for those who are enlightened, tasted, partakers, tasted the good word of God, if they turn aside. Who is the supreme example of the person that turned aside? Judas. Therefore, every single thing that's written in this passage could be written of Judas Iscariot. And yet the scripture says he was the perfect counterfeit. He never believed. He betrayed what he said he believed and turned aside to eternal judgment. I have to add this. I believe there are people with whom God deals, gives them the word of God, shows them the powers of the age to come, reveals himself to them, even granting them repentance so that they can say, I'm sorry. And turn around and start to walk in the right direction. There are people like that. Who get to the place. Where they turn from God and persistently walk away from him. When you persistently walk away from light you can only go into darkness. No matter how you justify yourself. And Jesus said I am the light of the world. He that believes in me shall not walk in the darkness. He shall have the light of life. If we're really believers, we will be walking in the light. If we're really believers, we will be producing fruits of the Spirit in our lives. If we are really believers, we will be the good ground that's spoken of in Hebrews chapter 6. The good ground, notice, does not become bad ground. The good ground endures and produces fruit. The bad ground tears thorns and briars. The end of it is to be burned. Beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, the things that go along with salvation. What goes along with salvation? To walk with him. To produce fruit. To have a hunger for his word and a thirst for his righteousness. And to know that you have passed out of darkness into light because you love the brethren. These are the fruits of good ground. Only you can know this morning whether or not that ground is truly good. I can't. Your neighbors can't. Only God. But he says there are things that will tell us. Enough so we can be sure. If we see a consistent pattern of life that is in the light with Christ, filled with love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and temperance, and self-control and faith. Then we are looking 
at the good ground of Scripture in the life of the Christian. And that ought to give us the encouragement and the strength to go on, regardless of the difficulties and the things which assail us every day of our lives. There are hard nuts in the Scripture. We're going to be dealing with them progressively. This is one of them. But if it really is teaching, and I say this to all those that believe they can lose their salvation, if it really is teaching that you can lose it, check the Greek word impossible in verse 4. And you will find out that is exactly the same word used a little further on in verse 18. By two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Same word. Impossible. Impossible. If you're really going to take it literally, you ain't no how going to come back. Impossible. I think as Christians, we have to look squarely into the whole context of Scripture. And for me at least, be governed by the words of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 6. Verse 37. All the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will not ever cast him out. There's our security. There's our hope. In the faithfulness, the immutability, and the love. The consistency of the living God, who is the Savior of all mankind especially those that believe. Salvation is a gift. It comes by grace. It's appropriated by faith. It is productive of good works. No works, no fruit, no reason to believe anybody ever got anything. I think if we apply that rule of thumb, it'll be a lot easier to deal with the problems of Hebrews 6 and many other passages in the Word of God. Shall we pray? Our Father, thy word is truth. Sanctify us through thy truth. Where we have erred in our thinking, forgive us. And teach us through thy Holy Spirit the great truths of thy word. For we are persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything that is in all creation shall be able to separate us from your love which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Bless us now. And if there's any person here this morning that has never known the love of Christ and has perhaps been playing games with you and thinking because they have Christian terminology and try and emulate Christian teachings that automatically that means they're Christians, check them up, Lord, and give them neither rest nor peace until they shall make their peace with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Gospel of John. We're in the sixth chapter. The great discourse on the bread of life. One of the great teachings of the Gospel of John. No one can come to the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved unless the Father draws them. Now, this is not Calvinism. This is not Augustinianism. This is good old Johinian New Testament theology. Jesus said, All the Father gives me will come to me. Verse 37. And whoever comes to me, I will not ever cast him out. Verse 39. This is the Father's will which hath sent me that all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up at the last day. All right? You learn in verse 37, all the Father gives me will come to me. I will never cast them out. Verse 39, this is my Father's will. Those he has given me, I should lose none. So your security doesn't rest on Calvin, doesn't rest on systematic theology, doesn't rest upon your church's doctrine or a creedal affirmation. Your security in Christ depends upon the fact that Jesus said, This is my Father's 
will. Now, there are other passages which coincide with this. Verse 44, No one can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 65, Therefore I said to you, No one can come to me unless it were given to him by my Father. This fits perfectly with John chapter 10 in the great discourse on the Good Shepherd. The Lord Jesus is not only the bread of God and the bread of life, but he is the Good Shepherd. Listen to him again. My sheep hear my voice, verse 27. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone, including Satan, snatch them from out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all. No one is able to pluck them from my Father's hand. I and my Father, we are in agreement. We are in union. We are one. Now, it is very significant that our salvation, therefore, does not depend upon emotion, does not depend upon theology, does not depend upon creedalism, does not depend upon charisma or the leadership of the church or ministers or clergymen of any variety. Our salvation rests upon a decree of the Father based upon the redemption of the Son. Now, Jesus said, And I, when I am lifted up, will draw all mankind to myself. Which means that it is the will of the Father that all men should have an opportunity to respond to his grace. It's very clear in the epistle of Titus. The grace of God, which brings salvation, says the King James Bible, has appeared to all men. That is not the way the Greek text reads. The Greek text reads, the grace of God, which brings salvation to all mankind, or was manifested for the salvation of all mankind, has appeared. So what we're being told in the Greek is that God's salvation has been manifested to all mankind everywhere with the intent that all men respond. So it is not that men cannot believe. It is that when given the opportunity, as Jesus said, some will not believe. They just won't, no matter what. And God does not compel them. The grace of God, says Paul, has appeared for the salvation of all mankind. That's the intent of God's redemption, to redeem all mankind. Though he knows who will and will not respond, still the intent of the gift was to bring us to life in Jesus Christ. In 1 John 2.2, 2, there is a very important passage that cross-references with this. He, Jesus Christ, is the satisfaction for all our sins. That's pretty clear, isn't it? He's the satisfaction for all our sins. And not for ours alone. That's the church but for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ was manifested to pay the price for the sin of the whole world. Well, says the Calvinist, then why isn't the whole world saved? Answer, because it will not accept the sacrifice of Christ. If God puts a million dollars on deposit 
in California First Bank of Costa Mesa in your name. And if you never write a check on it, whose fault is it? Yours or God's? God deposited the gift of eternal life by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for you and me and for the sins of the whole world. It is not that men can't cash the check. They won't. Because they choose to walk in darkness and to follow the ways of sin. That's why the wages of sin is death. But before payday, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the good news of the gospel. So, in John chapter 6, I would be remiss as a professor of theology if I did not point out to you that salvation rests upon the decree of God. All the Father gives me will come. Whoever comes, I will not ever cast out. You can't come unless my Father draws you, and whoever my Father gives me, I will lose nothing. Now, you don't have to be a great logician, a great scholar. All you have to do is be able to read English to get the message from John 6. If you're in Christ, you are secure, and you can get out of Christ the day that Christ gets out of God. And not until. Now, there are people that will say to you, including Dr. Wood and others, and they're good, respected scholars, yes, but there are other passages to which I respond. Yes, there are. But there's no other passage in the New Testament which says, this is my Father's will. Find it for me. Find me a passage that says, this is my Father's will that if you sin and backslide, you will be lost forever. Find me the passage. You won't. But I'll find you the passage here that says, This is my Father's will that I will lose nothing. That's good enough for me. My security and salvation rests upon what Christ did, what He promised, not how I feel. So I disagree with those who say you can lose your salvation because... Salvation is not something that you earned. It's not something that's due you. It's not something that's a debt. Salvation is the gift of God. By grace you have been saved through faith, not by yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. The classic error of Arminian theology, which teaches that you may be saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost, and that you never, ever really know, the error of that theology is based on John 10, where they tell you, yes, it's true, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand, and nobody can take you from the hand of Jesus, but you can walk out of God's hand by your own free will. Let me demolish that argument forever. You didn't walk into God's hand by your free will. Never. Because you were sold under sin. You were the slave of sin. You could not save yourself. It was the grace of God that touched you and gave you the capacity to will and to accept Christ. Is that not true? Left to your own devices, you would never have come, and neither would I. Dr. Barnhouse used to say, God did a wonderful thing for us with grace. He jiggled our willers because they weren't working and by jiggling our willers by grace, he made it possible for us to respond to his love and mercy in the Lord Jesus. Now, if a person says, yes, I did accept Christ by an act of free will. I did walk in by myself. Okay, let's assume that you did. 
You can't walk out by yourself. Because the scripture says, you are not your own, you have been bought with a price. So after you give God back the cross, God will give you back your soul. Just remember that. The cross is what it cost God to save you. He purchased you on the cross with the blood of his Son. You are not your own anymore, glorify God in your body. And you say, but I don't want to do that. I want to pursue sin. God says, try it and find out what happens to my property when it doesn't do what I want it to do. And remember Jonah. He tried it a long time before you did. Remember? Go to Nineveh, Jonah. No, I am going to Tarshish. And God said, have a good trip. You don't even have to read any further to find out where he ended up. He was God's property. Now, it's interesting. God never compelled Jonah to go to Nineveh against Jonah's will. Did you notice that? He never did. He just put him in the belly of a fish for three days. And after three days of slopping around in the ocean depths, swallowing salt water, being regurgitated around with all kinds of dead fish, eaten at by stomach acids, hot, sticky, wet, sick, smelly, Jonah suddenly exercised his free will. Get me out of here. I will go anywhere. God said, freely, freely, good. And guess where he was? Nineveh, the regurgitated prophet. Not regenerated, regurgitated. <laughs> and he went and preached. So you got to remember something. The sovereignty of God is a very tricky thing. On the outside of the door of heaven, it says, Come to me. Enter in at the straight gate. When you get inside and you turn around over the door, it says, You have not chosen me. I have chosen you and ordained you to bring forth fruit. So you have a limited freedom, so do I. But it's God's universe and God's running the show. You have an opportunity to respond to that grace. If you don't, then you are the one that pays the price for it, not God. Because you were given the opportunity. So John chapter 6 not only discourses on the bread of life. But John 6 discourses on the fruit of eating that bread. The benefit of eating the bread is to live forever. I am the bread of life, verse 35. He that comes to me shall never be hungry. He that believes on me will never be thirsty. Whoever drinks of the water that I give him, it shall become in him a well of water that springs up and bubbles over unto everlasting life. Verse 46. Not that any man has seen the Father, except he which is of God. He has seen the Father. That's the Lord Jesus. No one ever looked upon the face of the Father but the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verily, verily, I say to you, verse 47. He that believes on me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. One of the greatest passages in New Testament theology, and we pass over it so lightly. 47. In the Greek, Hemen, Hemen, Legohumin, I am truly telling you, he that believes in me, Aki Eonion Zois, he or she possesses now everlasting life. 
and shall never come to judgment, as we found in John 5, 24, but has passed out of death into life. Notice he follows verse 47 with this phrase, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and their dust, this, is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and never die. Talking, obviously, about the Spirit. Look at the repetition. I am the living bread. Verse 35. I am the bread of life. Verse 48. I am the bread of life. Verse 50, this is the bread that came down from heaven. 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he will live into all eternity. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the minute he said that, talking symbolically, the Jews took it literally. They argued among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's cannibalism. That's forbidden under the law of Moses. You can hear him. I can hear him screaming now. Jesus said to them, I truly tell you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Oh, that really did it. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood possesses eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day. Notice how he brings in here flesh and blood. Very significant. Cross-reference 54 with 35. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never be hungry. He that believes in me shall never thirst. You see the symbolism? Clear as crystal. Bread and drink. Again, Eat and drink. What does it mean to eat flesh and drink blood? Not cannibalism. It means to come to Jesus is to eat. And to believe in Jesus is to what? Drink. The symbolism is complete. My flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so whoever eats me shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not the kind that your fathers ate, manna, and are dead. He that eats of this bread will live forever. Now, as he's teaching this, this is shock therapy, the Jews explode. And even his own disciples start to doubt. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult saying, verse 60. Who can understand it? Sure, it's difficult, unless you've been listening. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said, Does this offend you? What if you should see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Does that shock you, what I just said before about flesh and blood? Wouldn't it shock you more if you suddenly saw heaven open and I were to ascend into heaven? Look at verse 63. This is the key to the whole chapter. It is the Spirit that makes alive. The flesh profits you nothing. The words that I am speaking to you are not literal. They are spirit, and they are life. Do you understand, Jesus said? I'm not talking about literal flesh and blood and eating my body. I'm talking about coming to me is to eat of the bread of God. Believing in me is to drink of the life of God. And to eat and drink is to live for all eternity. I am the living bread. Come to me and feast forever. The Catholic Church turned this into an unbloody sacrifice. 
at which at the moment of consecration, when the chalice is lifted at the sacrifice of the Mass, quote, the body, soul, blood, and divinity of Jesus Christ is present under the appearance of bread and wine. Close quote. No, it isn't. There is no sacrifice. The sacrifice is once for all. Read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. He hath offered one sacrifice for sin forever and sat down at the right hand of God. It's over. There is no sacrifice of the Mass. There is no sacrifice of the communion table. What the communion table represents is your participation and my participation in the life of God. We have come to Jesus and we have believed in him. We are eating of the bread from heaven and drinking of the fountain that never will run dry when at the communion table we bow our heads, confess our sins, and we celebrate what Calvary means. God reconciled us to himself by the death of his Son. Christ is mystically present spiritually present at the Lord's table. The bread and the wine or the bread and the grape juice are a means of spiritual grace to our souls, not because in themselves they are anything but bread and wine or bread and grape juice, but in themselves they represent the bread of God, spiritual food. And we are eating and drinking participating in the life of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what we are doing at the Lord's Supper. It is not just a symbol. It is a participation by faith in God himself. Break thou the bread of life. We sing this at the Lord's table. Dear Lord to me, as thou didst break the bread beside the sea. Beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, thou living word. The Lord's Supper is to participate in the life of God by faith. To eat of the bread of heaven is to come to Jesus Christ and believe in him as Savior. And if you've come to Christ, if you've believed in Christ, hear the words of your Father. This is the will of him that sent me. Of all he has given me, I should lose nothing. I shall raise it up at the last day. Whoever eats my flesh, that comes to me, and whoever drinks my blood, believes in me, dwells in me, and I in him. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall live by me and shall live forever. The words I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Who has ears to hear? Hear what the Spirit says to the church and rejoice. Our Father, we are in thy presence in praise and thanksgiving because of the wonder of this passage that we have been united by faith with thee for all eternity. That it is your will that we should never be separated from you and that you have given us to your Son and that he will lose none of us but that we shall enter thy presence one day with praise and thanksgiving, not by any works of righteousness which we have done, but according to thy mercy hast thou saved us. Bless us and help us on this day to think, Lord, not only of what you did for us on the cross, but of the freedom that has been purchased for us in our own land by the blood of many men and women who died that we might be free politically, 
economically, militarily, that we might have a land of freedom, which you gave us. The price of our liberty is eternal vigilance. Teach us that. But teach us to learn, most of all, that our strength is not in our missiles, not in our space stations, not in Star Wars, not in anything that we can...